I think it's time to get this thing going. Yeah, it's a little bit of comedy of errors here, but we're, we're, we're moving along. Welcome everybody into the Nutmeg Tavern. We are live. We're going to be talking about fun 18th century stuff today. And I'm your host, John Townsend. And you're out there. I can see you folks from Michigan and all sorts of places. There's people from England and New York. And people are asking about the earthquake, which I don't, I didn't feel any earthquake, but we're not that close to New Jersey or Pennsylvania, so nothing, nothing scary here. Um, we just ended up with, what was, what was last week's video? I already forgot. Was it the, was it the, we did foraging, <laughs> we did foraging that's right. Foraging was last week's video. And before that, the macaroni machine. I'm, I am uh, unhappy that the macaroni machine hasn't been as popular with people as it, as it should be because that was an incredible project. It's just hard to get people in a thumbnail and a title to recognize what they're going to see there. It's hard to tell people. It's like, we're going to be making Jefferson's pasta machine and say, anyway. <clears throat> anyway, foraging, yes, stinging nettles, lots and lots of comments. Just I they couldn't believe that I was just pick stinging nettles uh, because, you know, ouchy and all that good stuff. And when I was a kid, oh, yes, yeah, stinging nettles were terrible. Young stinging nettles aren't that bad, and maybe I'm just tough. I think you've probably worn out your sensitivity to your life. Yeah, maybe I'm, just, maybe I'm just tough enough I could pick stinging nettles. They ain't a problem anymore. I didn't have a single, single, even the minorest sting on the stinging nettles. No problem whatsoever. And the cool part is you can get totally back at them by eating them, right? So I think it's just totally... Of course, taking nettles. Yeah, exactly. Well, they deserve they really it. They really do hurt. I'm always surprised by when I actually get stung by one. I'm like, that really hurt? And it stays around longer than you would think it would. Yeah, yeah. So yes, when part of, part of where I... No, we didn't shoot any of them to this time, but part of where we've shot them before... Um, as where I grew up, the piece of ground where I grew up, and it's got a lot of black dirt right there by the ditch. And it has, at least in the day, mountains of, of uh, stinging nettles. So it's like all stinging nettles, right? But it's not, it's mostly grass now. Anyway, um, today we're gonna be talking about, because, you know, the eclipse is coming up and it does seem to be kind of in the news, I guess, you know. People are slightly interested in the sun being blotted out by the moon, um, which you know is fair. Um, but uh, I th we thought we would kind of cover that topic, and we don't tend to pay much. And maybe unless you're on the coasts and you do a lot of stuff with the ocean and tides, most people really don't pay that much attention to the phases of the moon, what's going on with it. Um, in the 18th century. Almost everyone knew what was happening with the moon. It was really important. Um, you know, you were interacting. You had a reason to know what what the phase of the moon was and all that kind of good stuff. Well, so we'll, we'll be covering uh, that in images and uh, talking about some books and, and whatnot. Do I need to grab anything before we start out off on the topic? I do have a super chat from Mandatory Carrie at the doctors, but I'll watch the rerun. Thank you very much for your super chat. Um, and um, I don't know, did, did anybody, how, how is, let's see, people, is anybody going to Fort to Shark this weekend? Uh, that reminds me, we'll talk, we'll, we'll mention um, the reenactor schedule uh, toward the, later on in the, in the thing. So if people are interested in going to historical events uh, around the country, you can find them on that website and we'll, We'll talk about that. Uh, people are losing their mind over the, the eclipse. Uh, yeah, we are, we are not too far away from the total eclipse area. So it runs, uh, the, the swath runs south of us about an hour or so away. So we'll actually be traveling to go and maybe the sun will be out. Maybe there will I, be clouds. I'm picturing it being totally cloudy the whole time. That's yeah, well, but it, it'll at least get really dark during the day. 
<laughs> we'll have fun with that. Let's jump in and look at some of these moon slash eclipse slash people telescope, telescope and all kind of good stuff. And boom. Um, why, why are one of the reasons why people are interested in what the phase of the moon is? People, there isn't enough daylight in the day, right? And you want to get work done. And there's a lot of farming work that, that can get done by the light of the moon. And you can do things specifically to a full moon that you can't do at a new moon because it's really, really dark. So full moons are really handy. And, and boy, it, it can be so bright when you have a really full moon. And, you know, depending on what the weather is, sometimes you have a full moon in, in the wintertime and it just seems like, you know, it almost seems like daylight. Here we have an image, a painting uh, from the 18th century of people harvesting during a full moon. And one of the moons is called the Harvest Moon. <clears throat> we, we don't really think about the names of the moons and why they're called that, but it's because it's the full moon that happens at harvest time, and you can harvest during that, that full moon. You can get some extra hours. And as you get toward that time of year, that's really handy because you, <laughs> you're used to summertime and the you know, sun being up for a long time, and then, boy, it really starts to close in on you fast. And having a full moon at that time of year really helps you get the job done. And harvest is one of those really important times of the year when you have to, if it's going to rain soon, you have to harvest it or else you're going to lose the crop. Bad things will happen. Maybe, maybe it just won't be as good. So things really need to happen at that time of year quickly and harvest, having the time after dark um, to get things done is really important. Um, is this the, this isn't the, uh, this is the, the book the, on kind of the cover of one of the almanacs. And there, okay. in the almanacs, they very specifically talked about lunar eclipses, solar yeah. eclipses. It, they, it was one of the things they made note of. And right. Me when was it gonna happen. Right. So let's, let me jump, jump back out here for a second. Yeah. So, uh, here is an almanac from... 1798 this is an actual um, period almanac and lots of people were interested it is one of the most popular things to be printed and an almanac is something like you know Benjamin Franklin is famous for his almanac he wasn't the first person to do almanacs in uh, in America but you'll have an part of the almanac is just interesting stuff right articles and whatnot but you'll have a section of an almanac like this i think we'll see one later on right um and it talks about a lot about what's happening with the moon and um you know it'll give you the phases it'll give you there's like a, a little chart at the beginning to tell you for the entire year what how many days old the moon will be on certain days, right? So it'll tell you, okay, the new moon in this month is this, the full moon is then, and then how many days old it is, so that you can do all these calculations about exactly where you are in the month. So here's this almanac, and it's this one's for 1763, it being uh, the third year after a leap year, is that what it means? Yes, and all the almanacs seem to list that as, you know, to give you a sense of where right. you are. Like in you cycle. wouldn't know. I I, I guess like, they're just making wait, sure you no, know. What year is this after that? It's like, well, leap year is oh, it's on the zero, the four. The, anyway, <clears throat> that seems strange. Like you would forget that all of a sudden. Um, then you'll have all these, you know, it says, it's like you want to know about the astronomical, astrological, meteorological observations, the state of the, blah, blah, blah. Um, tables of the rising and exactly where the seven stars are. Uh, real fun, complicated stuff in here. And what does it say? Is, is there a thing about the um, eclipse in this particular one? Mm, yeah, eclipses. It says uh, having solar ingresses, eclipses in various uh, configurations, aspects. Yeah. So you can find all this. Here's a page from the inside of, of this 1763 almanac. Uh, the tells you exactly where the new moon is, the first quarter, um, when you have full moons. This one even has 
new style dates and old style dates. So this is soon after, I think it was in the 1750s, when they did the, they changed the calendar. And for a while after that, they kind of showed both the new calendar and old calendar. They wanted to catch up to make the calendar right again because of the leap years and the calendar kind of got goofed up there by the end of the 18th century. So they had to change calendars. And so this one has the, uh, the old style and new style dates. I think it was like an eight day. They like moved ahead eight days and people were complaining. I've lost eight days of my life. <clears throat> it's kind of like leap year. I mean, uh, um, daylight saving time. Oh boy. Somebody was asking whether they had daylight saving time in the time period. Um, Benjamin Franklin talked about it. I don't think they they enacted it uh, during that time period, but it was certainly one of those things they were talking about. And back then, it made a whole lot more sense because lighting was was difficult, um, and it was important to have you know work time. But um, yeah, anyway, not not going into that. Uh, it looks like they. It says that. Uh, 18, 1908 might have been the first. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they, it's like back and forth. Mm. And particularly it took them a while. During world wars, they played around with it and did, did the different things. Um, anyway, you can see that this, this part of the almanac, very specifically about what's going on, it gives you the sun rising, the moon's south degrees or minutes or something like that. The moon, when it, that little D shape there, Looks like the letter D. It says the D rises and sets. That's that's the moon. That's the symbol for the moon. Don't ask me why the moon has a D symbol. It's not quite the D. It's like a little. Anyway, they they use these. If you can see on the other uh, right side here, they've got the, all these little kind of like strange uh, characters there um, for uh, different different things that are going on. That they have a <clears throat> little helpful. Uh, charts inside the almanacs to help explain <laughs> what some of those things mean. And uh, almanacs were popular in England and in North America, and they were also like German almanacs. A lot of German almanacs were published here in uh, in the in North America for German settlers. And so there's different kinds, uh, and they're very, very, very popular. Phew. Whoa. <clears throat> um, here we have a full moon. It's a, it's, it's, there aren't as many paintings of nighttime, right? It's I, hard I to think do. for the artists, it's just more it's, difficult it's to It's challenging. And, but here we have this, this moonlit scene, um, and people in a boat here, like they're going to be doing something. Usually the wind is very, very settled, uh, after, you know, this, if it's a full moon, this is right after, it's right after moonrise, which of course is right after sunset, uh, which is usually the calmest time. That's why we see, a, you know, very calm water there. They got their sail up, but it's not pushing them anywhere. Um, and they have a fire on board. Maybe they're doing a special kind of fishing, uh, but normally you would think if you were using fishing with light on board, with a fire, then you wouldn't be doing it during the full moon because that would distract the I'm fish. wondering how much artistic license is being yeah. taken with this. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, another thing we see here, I don't think it's reflected in uh, other paintings, is the idea of moving your cattle by moonlight. And mm. they would even drive their cattle to market on full moon nights. That's right. I did run... And it, to me, that would be helpful because there would be less traffic at night. Yeah. So, And maybe you have to travel more than one day. Yes, and that, if you have to travel more than one day, what do you do with your cows, right, at night? Yes. It's like, okay, I'm halfway there. What are you going to do? Put them up in a motel or something? <laughs> uh, so you're going to continue to basically to drive them. Mm -hmm. So you need to drive them to when it's light enough to see. And so the full moon is a perfect time to drive your cattle to market. Hmm. <clears throat> There we go. And other things are very, very popular on full moon nights. So having public festival nights or parties is popular 
for full moon nights because people are having to travel to your party and they don't have headlights on their cars. <laughs> Maybe they're walking. Maybe they have carriages. How do you see where you're going? You could drive your carriage right into the river. No one wants that. Yeah, you wouldn't want that. And so, um, basically, full moons are festive times. And if, wait, I, I forgot one thing. Let me jump back here. Two, two things, because Lauren pointed this out. Um, so notice here on our almanac, we have red, we have red uh, ink. And why are some of the things red and some things not? Well, the red things here, the red dates, are red letter days. They are days of festival. So if we look at that one, we have Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, uh, the Sunday after Easter. We've got, um, you know, two Sundays after Easter. If you look on the other side, we have Christmas Day. We mm -hmm. have, you know, all these special um, basically religious holidays, those are red letter days and other things will be, you know, set out in the almanac. Like yeah, that. I think there was one of them I was looking at, there was a, a birth in the royal family. And yes. It was marked down in exactly. the almanac. And yeah. Special, special days, whether they're religious or not, um, even, even uh, sort of secular days there, uh, are red letter days. Sometimes we can lose track of what the meanings of those special words are. But uh, here we have that, that party going on. They're just like a ball, right? And they're, they're going there. We have lots of people in the street. And they, um, you can see the illumination out in front, but every place else, they can still see what, what they're doing, where they're going. Um, there are... Um, eclipses, of course, happening and during our time period. And here's one where they're talking about the eclipse of the sun that will appear in London, July 14th, 1748. Now, this one looks like it must have been almost a total eclipse, but not quite. Is that the Yeah, I, in, in the magazine, it might talk about how... But it does look like that's what they're... Sorry, it's not showing up on my screen yet. But... And they, like, they were very precise about it. And yes. helpfully, they gave, like, there's a particular magazine article that I believe is referring to this eclipse. And it, right. it gives the times of when it's going to start and how long it's going to take and when it's going to be at its totality. And Yeah, and of course, I mean, just like what we were talking about, you mm -hmm. have it has to be very, very specific for the location. So um, this, this one here they're talking about, well, London, it's going to be like this. And then I think in that article it says something like in... Uh, Kensington mm, or, yeah. or Kettering or I can't remember what it was um, exactly what when the time was that it would happen and very interestingly uh, I don't have it in this particular one but do you remember the one where they were talking about setting their clocks I can't I it might have been in the Jefferson one where it was talking okay. about that 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 people were on the watch for the eclipses because it could help them know exactly what time it was at a particular right. where, if they knew where they were and mm. what the eclipse was going to be at where they were, then they could set their clocks by, which there aren't that many opportunities to set your clock properly. And their clocks were not as precise as ours. So if you live out in the country, a couple right. miles from the town clock. But your almanac would also be, be, I mean, if it's telling you exactly when your sunrise and moon. Yes, uh, that, and that would help rises, as well. You, the the, the rise and set would really too. help. So there we go. So this one, we see, you know, the, the city there and the, the people with their telescopes getting ready to be blinded by the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> blinded by the eclipse. Don't, don't look at the eclipse with a, like that, I don't think. No, not, not a good thing. Um, but um, we see them kind of using... They have a little diagram there of, uh, you know, what happens there was like, well, there's you and something's getting in the way and you can't see that. I'm not sure exactly everything in the, uh, in the image, what all those different circles are supposed to mean. I think R must be the moon um, or, I don't know, X and then, I don't know. Uh, alas. It's complicated. This, I could not find. I tried to find specifically what piece this was drawing was from so that right. I could attach the, you know, layer, like, well, what does B mean? What does, you know, 
which one's the Earth? Is there Earth's atmosphere? You know, but yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. I could not find it, unfortunately. Yeah. So, hmm. interesting, nonetheless. Um, there's the an image of an eclipse during harvest time. Another another interesting one. And this uh, one would be a lunar eclipse. Okay, there and, you go. Yes, uh, because it specifically is saying that this is the harvest moon that's being. It, it's not well, a daytime picture; it's a nighttime one. There we go. So it's a harvest moon being eclipsed, which that's the Earth getting in the way of the full moon. And mm -hmm. so this one, I mean, it looks a little. Um, with the dark circle, it, it, it's deceptive. Yes, right? it because is. Because that's had, not how it works. I had to, I had to change this uh, picture quite a bit. It was, it was faded enough that it was a little hard to see the eclipse over in the corner. Right. And, I mean, they could probably nail the, the year right down. Because when, when do you have a lunar eclipse on the harvest moon? And yeah, I'm sure you, they, they were. You, it, they, this may even have... I mean, this one just says seventeen. Yeah, it just gives a range. That's the art. I think that was the artist's yeah, time lifespan. span. But anyway, yeah, here we go. Um, Berkeley and Jefferson uh, intelligencer, and um, an eclipse is going to happen. A total eclipse of the sun. Um, beginning of the eclipse at this particular time. Total darkness. Middle of it. And then uh, the exact duration. Moon sh dark shadow will cover a spot on the earth. Blah blah blah. Two hundred miles broad. Uh, so they they had they knew exactly what was what was going to happen, um, and they had all of that all those mathematics worked out for quite a while. Um, traveling in the look at the on the. What is this? Um, <laughs> This eclipse will wear off at the North Pole of the Earth about the year A.D. 2344. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, here is another uh, path of an eclipse. And do we know the date on this one? Warren 17. I can almost read it on Tuesday, whatever. Um, so again, in the 18th century, they're showing a path of an eclipse that's going uh, through, sort of from North America across the globe, going through Scotland and then through Europe. So that's, um, and then we can see in different places like Edinburgh is what it says up there, Edinburgh. <laughs> it's a complete, <laughs> Newcastle, it's almost complete. Uh, Quebec, it's almost complete. Uh, so we see what's happening with uh, where what it's like in different parts of the world, and I translated July twenty fourth. A C C X L V I I I I don't know which one that one is. I, I really <laughs> wish like this one. I I really wanted the original author of this chart to yes. sit down with me and walk me through it it's because like, now now what like, is all this okay really mean? now. Now, what's this particular one? Now, this one actually, you know, you can actually see the, the written. Uh, yeah, 1764 here, mm -hmm. faces of the eclipse, the principal places in England, Ireland, and France, Holland. Uh, so we can see exactly what it's like for different places. And again, it doesn't look like it's total, well, The Hague, uh, total for, for most of the places, um, except, you know, um, apparently way, way down at the bottom there, maybe. So, very Okay, do you want to yes. take a slight break, yes. swap back to you, and we can do some almanac readings. Yes, oh yes. So we've got here um, some of poor Richard's almanac. So we're not going to read the date stuff, but we, well, we thought, you know, because he put the funny sayings in there, or the interesting proverbs, or maxims or right useful whatever useful you want to call them information uh, they're always good and they're always some of them quite funny uh, and funny in the way because they're so awfully true <laughs> uh, this is talking about somebody who's died it says he's gone and forgot nothing but to say farewell to his creditors <laughs> 
Um, Lauren picked this one out, and I really like it. I've never heard this one before. Hunger is the best pickle. Right? Because mm. I've always seen spice, and, and I've always heard sauce, but I love pickle. Right. Uh, pickle. <laughs> Whew. Mm -mm -mm. He, uh, who is strong? He that can conquer his bad habits. Mm. That's true strength. Mm. I don't know if I want to be that strong. Mm. Here we go. If your head is wax, or is, if your head is made of wax, don't walk in the sun. And this one had a little picture that went along with it. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, I think there's probably more to that one. Uh, there was something I remember being at. Remember being at um, uh, Plymouth Plantation, and the guy was talking about the, your head, your brains being made of wax and oil, and if it was out in the sun, it melted. And was he the one who was? He was talking a bit about the moon as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And <laughs> that one, right. because there uh, are so many, and there was an, even another saying that we ran across in here, and I liked it, but I'm also like, I I feel like there's a meat to this saying right. that I could well be missing, like a true pithiness that has been a little bit lost in the language, like mm -hmm. the kind of the shadow of the meaning is still there, but some of the yeah. substance isn't quite making its way through. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. A light purse, a heavy heart. Um... How about that? This one's really good. Like, write this one down. Men and melons are hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should have, they, it should keep going and say, you need to thump both of them. <laughs> to, to, know their true <laughs> <laughs> to know their true To know their true word, yes. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. He's the best physician who knows the worthlessness of most medicines. The sleeping fox catches no poultry. Up, up. <laughs> so I think that's better than the early bird. Yes, thing. I liked that one. <laughs> Who cares about catching worms anyway? <laughs> we didn't want to eat those worms. I'd much rather have chicken. He that would travel much should eat little. I think about that one. It's probably because eating, eating when you're traveling will mess you up. <laughs> well. <laughs> now this one's oh so true. Old boys have their playthings as well as young ones. The difference is in the price. <laughs> I'm sure I've seen signs of that uh, exact thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just saw this one. <laughs> Mine is better than ours. <laughs> 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 Ooh. Ah, that one's good. <clears throat> mm. To be proud of knowledge is to be blind with light. Mm. I like that one. Mm. Yes. <sighs> it's easier to build two chimneys than maintain one in fuel. <laughs> Okay, every week we try to get to brand new and returning YouTube members, Patreon folks, all that kind of good stuff. Special supporters of the channel. And since we did last week as Marathon 16, and boy, that was like two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes of crazy goodness. Um, so we got a little bit to catch up with. So new and renewing members. Uh, just Steph, 79, Kana, Eric Martinson, Mr. LZ Music, Jerry's Makeup and More, The Zur, 
uh, Jordan Marrow, David Parker, Human Filth, there he is, Shelly Medford, Knight697, David Collar, Daniel Ebhart, J4YC33, and Ryan Apple Apple. We know that one. Uh, K and K plus three plus three and Midwest Minutemen, Jamie four four one three four and Helmgraf and then brand new Patreon supporters, Catherine Zimmerman, Daryl Monk, uh, Paige Minken, Greg Hurst, Derek Neese, and a special thank you to all those continuing Patreon supporters. If I named you all, it would take all the rest of the live stream, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate you. So thank you very much. Um, one of the things we talk about sometimes, um, because a lot of people that interact with the channel don't realize that there's more to Townsend's than what happens in a video on Monday or Sunday or or the live stream on on um, Friday. And that is that James said that we are an e-commerce business too. And what do we sell? All kinds of weird 18th century stuff. So if you need a tricorn hat or a Westcott, then we have that. We also have wonderful merch mugs and fun stuff like that. But Lauren here has brought up a couple of uh, new pottery pieces that we are selling brand new on the website. They're going to be in the catalog. Um, and this is a, and these are all uh, salt, <clears throat> salt glaze stoneware. So salt glaze is done by filling your kiln with your pottery. It doesn't have a glaze on the outside. When it gets really hot, say, I don't know, 2,200 degrees, I don't know exactly what it is. You toss a whole bunch of salt in there. It breaks the bonds and the sodium gets onto the outside of the pottery and creates this natural kind of glass and you have these wonderful salt glaze pieces. So uh, cool salt glaze hand turned made here in Indiana by the folks at Connor Prairie. Um, mixing bowl. There's a great um, little ceramic flask. A design very very similar to what you'd find in uh, the 18th century. There were pieces that were shown like this um, at Bathabra in North Carolina from the mid 18th century up until the 19th century. So there's uh, a little flask guy. Do you remember how much that held? It was about six ounces. About six ounces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they make a fine instrument. And also, very, very neat, um, a little ceramic funnel. So this little funnel guy. Again, based off of pottery pieces from this time period. Um, and this one also is from that same area, from the Bathabra or Winston-Salem uh, area. Well, and as soon as I saw the funnel, it made me think of the mushroom ketchup video where you're pouring the stuff into the bottles and, and you really need a funnel. <laughs> yeah, so this one has a very, very fine small entry, yes. which is very handy. I mean, look at that. It fits perfectly in something like that, mm -hmm. which is very rare to get a ceramic funnel that has a small enough uh, end so it won't, it'll fit inside of bottles and things uh, and not make a mess like, like I did. So, very neat. Okay, I've got a couple questions here. Yes. Somebody was wondering when the catalog will be out in the mail. Um, Ryan is actually working on it as we speak. Uh, so it will probably be in the mail in about two weeks, something like two that. Two to four weeks. Let's see, yeah, it's two to four weeks. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, you know, the mail, uh, the ponies are running a little slower these days. I don't know. Most of them maybe are limp or, you know, have a, have a, uh, have some kind of leg problem. <laughs> they got some stones in there. Some of them broke down by the side of the road for weeks at a time. <laughs> um, there's a uh, member chat from John S. I love the new merchandise. Thank you. I was, thought these ones were very pretty, uh, especially like the bowl in this set. And um, Max Harkle says, excited about that new mixing bowl. All my Townsend stuff is top notch. Yes, so and glad th these are very, very finely done. I'm always mm -hmm. impressed by uh, the pottery work that the folks at um, at Connor Prairie do. They really do an excellent job. Right, and very uniform. Yeah. Uh, uniform's really hard to do in yeah. pottery, and it 
turns out beautifully. Yeah. And and sometimes, you, I mean, a lot of times you can go and watch them do pieces there. They they make pieces right there on uh, at their at their site, and so it's really neat. And in the fall, they do. I got maybe a couple times a year. They do the firing uh, when you can actually watch them fire up the kill and you know and throw the salt in and all that good stuff. And I. Um, we'll do my best to put in the video for the salt glazing that we did. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. We mm -hmm. did, we did a video. I remember that. <laughs> sure. I think it was one of the thousand videos we did. <clears throat> anyway, we've done a lot of videos. Mm. Okay. Somebody's vacationing in the Smoky Mountains. Oh, sounds sounds like fun. Okay, let's jump back in. Um, did I miss any? Nope. So this is one weird slide. Um, this is people, uh, a, a comparison of the moons and how high they are on the moon versus, did I say mountains? Uh, the comparison of how high mountains are, I think my words came out wrong, how high mountains are on the moon or on Mercury and on Venus, and there's the Earth over there, La Terre, uh, the Earth too. So it's like, um, yeah, so there, I, now I can imagine that you could somehow figure out how high the mountains are on the moon in the 18th century by, you know, kind of shadows, etc. But I can't imagine that you would be able to figure out how high mountains are on on Venus I, or I Mercury. I was honestly really sad. I could not find the the um there wasn't you know more information written about this particular one and i really wanted to know you're like how how they come yeah, up with like this real. chart but okay real. i just love the chart so because i mean isn't like mercury all or i mean the venus all clouded up anyway how would you be able to tell how high the mountains are <laughs> maybe he sensed it i don't know what <laughs> huh hmm 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 uh thank you to uh uh, Tufts Magoyal for um, gifting memberships. Mm -hmm. That's Thank very, you. very kind of you. Um, uh, Kate Prime 30 says that it's 18th century radar. That's yeah, how they knew that how must to... be it. Or maybe they visited and they used, <laughs> That's a, how they they used a measuring tape. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> used those, uh, the, the, all the birds that they would yes, tie yeah, they together onto a frame and just a, flew up there. You know, a basket, the right kind of birds, the yeah. space birds. And... Yeah, if, if you, we've done some other episodes on the moon, uh, like the people living on the moon and remember yes, that episode. Yes, absolutely. So, that you know, was If you really want to go back into the, into the, the Nutmeg Archives. Archive, um, that one's very interesting. Uh, wasn't that, was that because they looked like elves we did it around Halloween or I can't remember. When I just ran it. across it. There was a pumpkin. Oh, that's, that's what right. made me find it, was I was looking for pumpkin things, and uh -huh. there were pumpkin houses on the moon. That's right. That's pumpkin houses on the moon. You probably didn't know that, <laughs> but there were. Now, this one is very interesting. So, these are maps of the moon. They're actually from the 17th century, and this is... These are two different maps, one a few years earlier than the other, like 1648 and 1651, done by two different people. And this is, of course, you know, the side of the moon that we can see, right? Face of the moon that we can see. Um, and on the one side, um, they kind of had one idea. And the one on the right hand here, these are a lot of the same terms that we still use today. So this one, this, this one on the right is a little bit later, but only by a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that's the precision that they had even in the 17th century for, for getting an idea about what was going on with the moon, mapping the moon. There's, what's the word for mapping the moon? Um, uh, like, Celianography. Yeah. Something close yeah. to that. Who, who knew there was a special term just for mapping the moon um but that that's what's happening with these two images people studying the moon in this time period and you kind of i mean on one hand you say now how useful is this um for somebody in 1650 to know it's like well that spot there is called you know the, we're, we're the gonna give it of, this name it's gonna be you know the sea of 
moon stuff. Uh, anyway, Jupiter or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we've got these uh, folks here using their, I don't know if it's really a telescope or if it's a... Or kind of a simple viewing device that yeah. kind of is meant for focus more than, you know, to... Yeah, or whether the artist was taking some license. I mean, it looks like the, I mean, the end to closest to the eyepiece is bigger than the... Hard to say. Lens at the, anyway, here they are. <laughs> They're looking at the moon. They've got this fun pole here with a... Maybe the artist just didn't know how telescopes worked. Oh, possibly, <laughs> possibly. Maybe um, the guy looking through the telescope didn't know how they worked. Yeah, yeah it's like, <laughs> dude, this is the other end. They're just supposed to be using. <laughs> uh, Maybe that's what the guy pointing at the other end is right, saying. Right. He's saying, dude. Isn't he doing it backwards? Uh, he's holding a dark lantern, though, the one that's pointing, so that somebody can write notes about the observations here. And, and even people behind them writing notes Probably copying the person who's right, mm -hmm. <laughs> who's yes. doing the thing. Um, but they are doing, uh, maybe they're making a map of the moon, you think? Maybe that's what this particular, <laughs> yes. I think you're going to need a better telescope for that. <laughs> Do you think so? <laughs> um, Diderot's Encyclopedia has a section on optics, and uh, we can see at the very top here, we have a, a reflecting uh, telescope. The kind you would use for the, you know these kinds of observations, you know, whether you're going to map the moon or not. Some of these other ones, uh, images are just like prisms and um, rainbow theory and all that good stuff about what's happening. We can see even the rainbow uh, ideas there uh, on that one shot. But then we have a a telescope, and it's kind of a a telescope that doesn't have a. It's like they put the lens way out there, and then the smaller lens, and there's no tube in between. Um, maybe because it's just like, well, we didn't, don't really need it. Um, Do you think it, that's just the artist's rendition to kind of give us a sense no. of what they're... Oh, okay, gotcha. No, I don't think so, specifically. Um, I, I think if you just have the, the lenses lined up, and it, of course it's dark out, you know, you don't have excess light that's coming in there. Um, and yeah, so Rainbow Theory, there's the aerial telescope, there's all kinds of good stuff there. Um, so... There isn't a lot in Diderot's with telescopes, as much as I would have figured, you know, that they would show something. Oh, I know. Something. I was surprised. you want to flip back to you for a minute? Oh, yeah. So sure. one of the things that I ran across while I was doing this was a, a piece about how Thomas Jefferson was really interested oh, yes. um, in this whole field. Mm -hmm. um, and he, when he had the time, he enjoyed, you know, he had studying a big telescope. And, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. writing about it, and I, I'm going to drop the. the um, but so you were saying about how he plotted out Monticello. He was taking right, right. So the, he was taking precise um, measurements of exactly when the 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 uh, eclipse began and ended, and all that kind of good stuff. And somebody else used his. Um, his numbers to calculate the exact position. So it's like, oh, you're exactly at X, Y, Z longitude or whatever. Of course, they were off, but um, but they were pretty close by eight minutes, I think, something like that. Hey, so I, you know. okay, whenever I read about people doing this, it makes me think about how they have a grasp of mathematics that I just do not have. <laughs> too true, too true. Uh, so yeah, the, and of course he thought that was super important for navigation. Of course, he, he thought that the United States ought to have its own prime meridian that we based everything off of. It's like, forget Greenwich, we need our own. It should go right through, you know, pick a spot. And uh, one of the things that he sent off um, Lewis and Clark with was special instruments so they could do, you know, observations and, and know exactly where they were at, plotting locations and all that good stuff. So, yes. Okay. Oh, oh, it's the giant telescope. Yes. Here we go. Head. Giant telescope. Uh, this was the 40-foot 40, 40 reflective telescope. Um, it became a, sort of like a landmark uh, there in England. Uh, this person had this just giant telescope, and people would come and see it. I think, uh, what did they say? They tore it down in the 1820s or 30s? 1840, I think it right. was. So. Right. So after a while, they, they took it down. Although parts of it are still... Um, are at an exhibit in mm -hmm. Greenwich or something like that. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, a telescope like this is 
a big deal in the yes. 18th or in, you know, this in the 19th century, but I don't know. Do you know when he made it? Uh, it might say on that sheet of paper that you've got mm -hmm. there in amongst all the other sheets of paper. I had so many sheets of paper. I, I feel like it was in the, after 1750. Right. But. Yeah. Well, they made it sometime. Uh, there's so much to know yeah, about any of these topics. Here we go. Yeah. Herschel's Grand Telescope. Da, da, da. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, completed in 1789. And just trying to imagine the, even now, building this sort of telescope would not be an easy task. Right. But well, imagine, grinding the mirror for yes. that is the biggie. Right. So you've got to grind this big mirror on the back side of that, and it's got to be very, very precise. So um, those are all done by hand, and it mm -hmm. takes a lot of... And I imagine uh, some of them, like that you had to do multiple tries. That oh, yeah. If something went wrong, you're like, well, it's like, well, that didn't work. Let's yeah. do it again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is a machine to uh, show you the rotation of the Earth and the rotation of the moon and what they look like in conjunction to each other. Uh, this was done in the 18th century. This person um, was very wanted to, you know, precise sort of model of that. And somewhere in my uh, collection of newspaper advertisements, there is um, somewhere here in North America, a exposition or, a, you know, they, they showed, they had like, you know, bought tickets and you could come and see a machine like this. Ah, yeah. And there were different kinds of uh, scientific shows that people would come and get a little lecture mm -hmm. and they would be able to see the machine working and that's exactly what we've got here someone uh their little uh diagram of exactly what their machine is like and you could even do a thing like you know have a candle or a focused lantern to to this is oh, what the sun to be, would be the right? sun <laughs> right to be the sun and then you would be able to see why uh, the the seasons change or why what happens when the eclipse happens and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of fun stuff like that. And this is uh, people watching a meteor. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was interesting. Uh, anyway, people watching a meteor, not and I I'm I'm in I'm guessing that it's a progression here in the sky of. You know, it being a round ball, and then it being oblong, and then it being stretching out with its tail. Uh, but that's my guess. I I don't know exactly what the what the artist was trying to represent here. So, were the mirror grinders the same folks who made Fresnel lenses? Mm, no, I don't think so. I don't. Fresnel lenses had to be either put together up out of separate chunks or kind of cast, like we would might make a Fresnel lens uh, today. Um, but grinding lenses and grinding mirrors was a uh, long, complicated in the process in the time period, and and you know, small ones is fairly easy. You'd have a sort of like a shape and. You know, use a special kind of mud uh, grinding compound to grind the glass. Really, really, you know, kind of go from a one grit, uh, one coarse grit to finer and finer until you, it's finally smooth and all polished. And um, mirrors, uh, I don't know, that sounds even, sounds even worse. <laughs> so I couldn't tell you about that. Whew. Okay. Did we get the most of it? Did we I do believe, it? Yes, we do. Do you have any? Uh, I do have else? a couple things. Okay. So, Speed and Tiles Styles, Tony sent in a Super chat? member chat. Mm -hmm. Cool new stuff. This is right after oh, yeah. we introduced our yeah. pottery. Very nice. And uh, there is a, oh, Mike Kruk gifted five Townsend's memberships. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, then there is a member chat from Jessica Gasparini. Townsend's illuminating 18th century for us every day. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to go out on reading just a couple more? Mm -hmm. Let's find a couple of good ones here. Sometimes you got to be a little judicious. You got to be cute. About. Some of them, some of them you really don't know. You're like, I know this meant something in the time period. I wonder what it, what it, what it did mean. When a man speaks to a man, 
look on his eye. When he speaks to thee, look on his mouth. See? See what I mean? See? <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> um, There are none deceived but he that trusts. So you can't deceive a non-trusting person. Mm. Trust anybody. Um, there is much difference in imitating a good man and counterfeiting him. Being honest and pretending to be honest. Mm. Um, he that has not got a wife is not yet a complete man. Um, <laughs> if you'd lose a troublesome visitor, i.e. to get rid of one, lend him money. <laughs> Poof. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> uh, and promises may get thee friends, but non-performance will turn them into enemies. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> hmm. Genius without education is like silver in the mine. Oh. <clears throat> A diamond in the rough. <laughs> well, i.e., if if you don't have the education, it's, it's silver in the mine doesn't. You can, can't not use it for anything. Any good. It's like, well, it's good, but it's down there, and I, it's not useful to anyone. Uh, many would live by their wits, but break for want of stock. Hmm. I have to chew on that one. Um, oh, lazy bones, dost thou think God would have given thee arms and legs if he had not designed thee, thou wouldst that should use them. So you should be using those, those things. You know, the one about the fox and the poultry was pithier than that. Yeah, Some that of was... them are in more of a rhyming form. Yes, rather than a... yes, <clears throat> yes, yes. No gains without pains. Mm -hmm. See? Rhyming See? form. <laughs> That's quick and easy. You learn from that one. Uh, okay, I've got a question. Yes. <laughs> so, Speed and Style Tony is wondering, how do they make the flask the, the flask hollow. So this flask is constructed out of two bowls. So you turn a bowl, you turn a bowl, and you put them together, you cut a spot, and you turn this, this spout separately, and then you place it on there. Uh, and then these ears are placed on there separately too. So this is actually made of one, two, three, four, five pieces that are glued together with clay. I never would have thought that's how you constructed it. Yep. That's how this one's made. Now, some of them you can make like a bottle and then you smash it flat. But mm -hmm. that's the, this is a, a little more a different clean route. way of doing it. Yeah. Somebody, there was one, one of the books that was describing them was talking about it being a flattened bottle. But yeah. not this one. <laughs> okay. Are we, all, are we all ready? I think we're ready. Mm -hmm. I think we did it. I think we're all now ready for the eclipse. And hopefully, you are in a place where you will be able to see it, uh, where there won't be clouds, and where there won't be an earthquake, mm -hmm. or possibly ships running into things, or anything like that. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I want to thank you for being here in the chat, um, being with us here on, in the Nutmeg Tavern, and kind of rubbing elbows, and having fun, and... and uh, you know, making jokes, and that's the fun part of, um, you know, we can we can make history uh, fun because because it's funny uh, sometimes and interesting all the time, regardless mm -hmm. of what we find out. So thank you so much for your amazing, kind support. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, mm -hmm. Ivy. And I hope you have a tremendous weekend. Thanks for watching.